I woke up this morning to deep research from OpenAI being available and spent pretty much the whole day running various research projects on it. Tons of you provided suggestions both here on YouTube as well as on X. We'll go through some of the ones I did in a little bit, but people that have been using it for a while are blown away. Some of the people that had early access, here's Derya Unutmaz, MD. He's saying it's an absolute game changer for scientific research, for publishing, for legal documents, medicine, education only from my tests, but likely many others. I am just blown away. For me, compiled things like how to deal with the MTHFR mutations for specifically mental health and energy, took about five minutes of research, 13 different sources, a glimpse into the current scientific perspectives on consciousness, what is it, right? So that took 10 minutes and 12 sources. Somebody suggested this to me on X, biosciences breakthroughs with AI, specifically focusing on genomics and proteomics, something that I personally am very interested in. This one got a lot of traction online, scientific clues that our reality might be a simulation, a bow ranger leveling guide for specifically act three of, of Path of Exile 2 for a non-hardcore league. You might be wondering like, why is that so specific? No reason ways to increase blood ketone levels on a ketogenic diet. I also uploaded my actual blood work to see what good or bad things it would spot and what I needed to fix it. That one actually ran for 23 minutes, one of the longer running projects. Now this Sam Altman tweet kind of jumped out at me. So this was before I really started using a deep research. He said, my very approximate vibe is that it can do a single digit percentage of all economically valuable tasks in the world, which is a wild milestone. So of course that would mean trillions of dollars of, of value of work automated by this deep research agent. At first to me, that seemed kind of like a very wild claim, but after after using this thing and kind of understanding the breadth of what it can do, kind of the scope of the task that it can do, I gotta say, I, I believe it. Specifically, I think this becomes true as you start relying on it and giving it harder and harder expert level questions, right? Level one is something that would get, you know, from a nature scientific journal from 2020, the proceedings from there, specific questions about a specific article that they published. Level two would be checking the end note found in the second to last paragraph of page 11 of the book with the whatever number, what date in November was the Wikipedia article accessed. And level three, we're talking about certain standards for grades of processed fruits and vegetables. And we're asking you to look at all of these sort of standards from 1959 and see what percentage of them as of August, 2023, what percentage of those standards have been superseded by a new version. I don't know about you, that would take me a long time to, to figure out how to do that, how to do all that research. And then finally, cause you have to figure out all the standards, what they were back in 1959, what they are now or in 2023. Right, and then figure out the percentage, but the amount of research going into that is insane. We've covered some of this yesterday, so these are expert level tasks in chemistry, in linguistics, in healthcare, saving, you know, four or five hours for healthcare, two hours for, for this particular gene therapy of deep research, if you will. So can this thing do, let's say, let's say a 2% of all economically valuable tasks in the world? I don't even know how to go about finding the answer to that. Actually, no, I think about it, uh, I just might. I'm just gonna post Sam Altman said this and just paste his quote in there. And then I'm just gonna take this description that they have of deep research on the OpenAI website. He said that about deep research, a new AI agent described here. I'll just paste that description in there. I'm gonna ask it. I'm gonna say, estimate what percent of the world's economically valuable work can be automated by this deep research agent. Give your answer rounded to the nearest percent. We're gonna hit deep research and away we go. We'll come back to this before the video is up. And of course, they'll come back with a clarifying question. Do we want all sectors or a specific focus? I mean, we're talking about all economically valuable work, so certainly all sectors. Should the estimate be based on global GDP contribution, employment share, or another metric? I don't know if GDP is the best metric for that. So to answer, we're gonna say, consider all sectors. I think that's fair. Let's use employment share. Let's use employment share. Consider what percent of a uh, given job is doing a research like this, right? So somebody that's doing, for example, trading, stock trading, equities trading, probably a large share would be doing research projects like this. Let's say it's 50% of the job. I don't know, I'm just guessing here, right? Something like this could automate 
50% of that job. So what's the total amount in aggregate that this would automate? And we don't want any comparisons, just deep research. So I'm going to hit go and uh, let's see if we can come up with an actual percent number of how much work this could replace. What percent of all economically valuable tasks this could uh, replace. So as you can see here, it started the research. While it does that, both the co-founder of HubSpot and Sam Altman also talked about this, but we think of the thing that we get back from this deep research, the report that it provides, we think of that as the output. So we ask it a question and this produces the output that we're looking for, the report. And so this is Dharmesh Shah. So he's the co-founder and chief technical officer of HubSpot. And apparently the man's been obsessed with AI agents before AI agents were even a thing. He's also invested in OpenAI, so something to keep in mind. But he asked deep research to create a detailed research report, including competitive analysis, positioning, growth, product strategy, and AI vision for the industry. And then I think about it, a lot of consultants, a uh, large part of their job is doing research like this. A lot of people in the legal profession, you know, especially if you're an intern starting, a lot of the time you're just pulling case files and just gathering all this sort of information, all the cases that you need before starting, you know, before starting to proceed with the case. But Deep Research produced an 11,000 word report with data citations tables and genuinely great insights, including some I hadn't really thought about before. But this is the important and insightful part. And what's interesting is in a second, I'll show you where Sam Altman basically says the same thing in very different words, but the idea, the core idea is the same. So here Darmesh is saying, what has me excited is not just that it can produce this kind of output. Though that's pretty cool. What has me excited is that we'll be able to use this kind of output as input to a subsequent step in the agentic workflow. So this report can be also thought as it putting together sort of a, a project and doing all the research, putting all the pieces together, kind of projecting forward in the future and creating a step-by-step -step plan on how to execute whatever you wanted to do. What does it do with that plan? Well, it gives it to something like operator. OpenAI's other recent sort of breakthrough where it's able to navigate the web and, and do stuff. In the future, even more so than just operator, lots of other AI agents capable of carrying out certain tasks, whether that's uh, using the internet, communicating, maybe doing Excel, doing coding, etc. So deep research is sort of step one in the process. And then that work, that report, that output becomes input for all the other little agents that then go to work doing and executing that plan. Another thing to think about is uh, potentially something like this could actually create specific AI agents for specific tasks. So as it kind of is planning ahead, actually writes out a little script or whatever it needs to, to create that agent for that particular task. So you tell it to launch a new marketing campaign for a particular product that's coming out. It can not only do that full sort of research, but also sort of spin up these little mini workers that go and start completing those tasks. Sam Altman met the CEO of SoftBank, Masayoshi Sun, in Japan, where they did some of these presentations. And he did give a speech. And part of the speech, he said this. Reasoning, as in reasoning models, it's, it's useful and exciting for a lot of reasons. But one of them is that models that can reason, models that can think, that can take multiple steps and sort of like deduce what they need to do, those paved the way for AI agents. So he's kind of saying the same thing, right? So that's sort of thinking through stuff. That's the output is the text that we see, but you can also think of it as input for that next step the agents that take that input and then go and do that thing. Surprisingly, the task we just gave it took only four minutes. It used 10 sources that we can look at here. So keep in mind that's here. So the reason how they're able to sort of reduce a lot of the hallucinations and stuff like that of these models kind of making stuff up as they go is they search the web, they find reputable sites. And you can, by the way, specify you want to focus on specifically peer reviewed science papers or like a more like broad way of searching, but it pulled from futuretech.media. It's looking at openai.com to learn more about deep research. So that's good. It looked at WEF Future of Jobs 2023 automation percentage, looked at sciencebusiness.net, researchgate.net, visualcapitalist.com, etc. By the way, if you don't like some of those sites or you disagree with some of those sources, you can actually specify like don't use those source sources. Try these other, you know, like peer reviewed articles or whatever. And so here's that paper. They're saying that recent estimates indicate that between 20 and 30, global employment falls into kind of the knowledge work category. These are roles primarily focused on creating or processing information. For example, managers, professionals, such as engineers, analysts, scientists, and even more some clerical roles. 
This means roughly one-fifth to one-third of the world's workforce is engaged in resource-intensive or information processing tasks in their daily work. You want to know where they got it from? Here's the link. Automation hits the knowledge worker, and this paper literally breaks down the sort of knowledge workers by continent, by kind of where they are in the world. And then they flag a certain other industries such as agriculture, manufacturing, construction, or hospitality, where it's mostly manual or routine tasks and then not as much of that kind of research and knowledge synthesis. It goes through and tries to understand kind of like the kind of tasks that a deep research can do, which is kind of interesting because it is sort of trying to figure out what it can do. Things like literature review, data analysis, drafting reports, and generating recommendations. Obviously, scientific R&D, healthcare, that's huge. This would be, have a big impact on those fields. Finance and business analysis. Obviously, it seems like generating reports about different companies. I mean, this is going to be a godsend. Legal and administrative services, right? So jobs like legal assistants and paralegals that involve summarizing documents and finding pertinent facts are amongst those with very high AI exposure. Upwards of 100% of the tasks could be affected from Visual Capitalist. And we've covered this on this channel before, like that whole paralegal, legal assistant, that's one thing where it's like a super, like one of the highest exposure to AI out of pretty much all of the jobs. And here it goes through and actually goes kind of sector by sector to estimate what percent of that sector in the entire sort of world could be automated. So first, professional services like consulting, R&D, technical. If 3% of global jobs and 70% of these tasks could be done by AI, that yields about 2% of total global work potentially automated. So that's 2% uh, in professional services, 1% of finance and insurance, 1% of information technology and media, about 0.8% of global work in education and academia, half a percent of public administration in, in the government, half a percent in manufacturing, engineering, other services, about half a percentage point. All right, so summarizing, we believe that knowledge intensive industries, they account for about 20 to 30% of global employment. If we assume a certain automation rate, then one half to two thirds of those tasks within those knowledge roles could be automated. And they arrive at the conclusion that in aggregate, this represents the order of 10 to 15% of total work hours worldwide that could be done by deep research AI instead of humans if it were universally deployed. So it's quite a bit higher than uh, Sam Altman certainly said. Now they, of course, list their assumptions because a lot of this requires assumptions to make certain calculations, et cetera. So they list all the various assumptions that they've made to come up with those figures. If you disagree with those assumptions, you can actually just tell it, say, hey, don't assume this, change that, and it'll regenerate some of that for you with the new assumptions. And get this, they also have cross-verification, right? So they're kind of verifying their numbers against other big studies and other big estimates that are in the field. For example, by OpenAI and how ChatGPT impacts current workers. McKinsey has a report projected that automation could display could displace up to 14% of the global workforce by 30 in an aggressive scenario, and how certain occupations might almost entirely be handled by AI. That's from Visual Capitalist. And so they're kind of looking at the rounded estimate of their aggregate range. And considering the overlap of sectors, we estimate roughly that 15 to 20% of all economically valuable work could ultimately be automated by deep research. For a single figure, they're saying 18%. Now I'll share this with you so I can actually share this chat with you so that you are able to take a look at it, go through it, see if it makes sense. Let me know what you think. Does it pass your sniff test? Does it seem accurate? If you think it's wrong, where did it go wrong? What was a wrong assumption that it made? Did it pull from the wrong data source? I mean, certainly it's considering kind of an aggressive scenario where this is deployed globally, where it is able to completely automate those tasks without any sort of human monitoring. And again, if you kind of cut that estimation in half, you kind of land more towards what Sam Altman was saying, that single digit automation of all economically valuable tasks in the world. Among other things I've tried, like I mentioned, so I loaded up my blood work. So it did notice that while all the levels are normal, it did notice that hematocrit, hematocrit, to the hemoglobin and the hematocrit, I'm going to assume that's pronounced. They're normal, but it's close to the upper range. But they did mention that you should stay hydrated, which I, I haven't been. I've been doing a poor job of that. And also, I asked some follow-up questions. For example, right around that time, I don't remember exactly when, I donated plasma to Red Cross, which if you've never done it, they take your blood, the vampires of the Red Cross, and they take this into this little machine that like 
I guess like it's a filtration system, some sort of a centrifuge that takes the plasma and then like returns the rest of the stuff, which is like the red blood cells and everything else, it returns it to you. So you sit there, it kind of drains your blood for five minutes, and then it like shoots it back in with the that solution, the IV solution. That was the weirdest sensation of my life. Getting your filtered room temperature blood, just put it back into your veins, feels weird. But the point here is that this deep research was able to look at my actual personalized blood results, do all the research, and then give me specific things that I should be aware of that I could do to improve it. I posted a bunch of different uh, reports that I did. This one seemed to get the most attention. What are the most convincing scientific arguments for us living in a simulation? By the way, if you're not following me on uh, Twitter slash X, please do. I've been stepping up my X game and uh, posting downright bangers, as the kids would say. So I'll post that link to all these threads in the comments. So check them out if you're interested. And let me know what you think. Is Sam Altman right that this might replace a, you know, a single digit replacement of all the economically valuable tasks, I meaning between one and 9%, let's say, right? Do you think that the report that we just generated where it's more like 18%, do you think that's more accurate? Or do you think both those estimates are way too high and it's not gonna replace anything? Let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear what you think. If you've gave me an idea to test with this thing and I haven't gotten to it, I am so sorry. I only have a limited amount of them. I've spent most of the day sitting there uh, uh, doing the various things on this thing and i'll be posting a lot more trying to get to other ones as they come in if you've submitted an idea thank you so much i really appreciate it hopefully i can get to it at some point and with that said if you made it this far thank you so much for watching my name is wes roff and i'll see you next time